Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's session on BIC Streams in collaboration with the Art Resources and Teaching Trust, ART Trust. Uh, today's session is Religious Architecture of Early Modern India, Encounters and Transformation of Sacred Spaces. Uh, there was so much enthusiasm for the session today that uh, four people turned up at BIC uh, expecting to see uh, all of uh, the panelists and uh, were quite disappointed that this is uh, only on BIC streams. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, joining us today um, on this panel uh, is Alka Patel, author and professor of art history at the University of uh, California, Hakim Samde Samir Hamdani, author and conservationist, Pika Ghosh, author and visiting professor, Haverford College, and Anupurna Garimela, who has put this panel together today and moderating it as well, who is an author, art historian, and a designer. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for doing this for us. Uh, just before I hand over to Anapurna, uh, we will be posting the full bios of our speakers in the chat box. Um, and do post your questions, comments, and observations in the Q&A box, both of which are at the bottom of your screen. Uh, with that, over to Anapurna. Thank you so much to Ravi, Raghu, Lekha, Naidu, uh, the entire BAC team, as well as Samir, Alka, and Pika for joining us in this conversation today. So I think I should, before I uh, start off uh, uh, the, each of the presentations, uh, there are sequenced in this way, Alka Patel will speak first, then uh, Samir Hamdani will speak next, and finally Pika will speak. And then we, we, we will have a conversation connecting each of our own research projects and work and specific histories, architectural and design, uh, uh, um, are architected and designed buildings that uh, we want to uh, uh, explore in our conversation and then we'll open it up to the audience for more questions. But before um, asking Alka to start her presentation, I wanna say a few reasons why I thought this was a panel that I wanted to put together and why I thought it was important to have this conversation in a public forum. So often um, the encounters between religious traditions is either eulogized or um, decried uh, nowadays, especially in the, the current dispensation that's around. And this isn't just in the subcontinent, it's all over the world. I wanted to dial back. I, I'm a person who always likes to step back and look at things from a quieter place. And I wanted to create that quieter place in front of the audience that BIC provides because BIC also provides a record of this conversation for people to access after today. So this quieter place would help me, and this is in a way a little bit selfish, would help me think about um, from my own perspective of working on the Deccan and on Tamil country, how do certain builders look at new kinds of buildings that are coming up in the neighborhood? How do builders who are building for new kinds of patrons think about their own tradition of architecture, not religion, architecture, when they begin to build for other patrons that they're not familiar with? How do materials, new kinds of materials, new classes of patrons begin to impact the way that builders think about the way they make a sacred, the, the way they make sacred architecture. More importantly, I really wanted as, or as importantly, if not more importantly, I really wanted architectural historians whose projects have been to focus on encounter, transformation, design, all of them, whether they're practicing architects, conservationists, teachers, authors, 
we're all thinking simultaneously, how do we write this history in a way that is respectful to both the objects we're writing about, to the communities these objects addressed in the past, to the communities our books and our research addresses, and how do we learn from each other in different places? And what might this architectural histories in progress, and they really are in progress, do in the world as they move today? So with this, I hand over the stage to Alka Patel, and I'm very grateful for her for sharing her work. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Oops, Anapurna. Um, <laughs> This is wonderful. Uh, so I guess I am supposed to stay visible while I also uh, share my presentation and I shall begin the process now. Here we are. So um, what I thought that I would do today is um, in some ways, trespass upon the generosity of my fellow panelists and also the audience to talk about a work in progress that very much builds, uh, I suppose there's a pun in there somewhere, upon, the, um, upon some work that I have already done. And previously I had written about this curious little building that is found in the western reaches of Afghanistan and has been known since the 1940s as the Masjid de Sangi. Um, and it is truly in what is now anyway an extremely remote part of the country. And um, it is uh, considered rather anomalous because it is this lithic uh, uh, built form in essentially an architectural culture that is very much brick based. Here, uh, perhaps the most contemporary and also a very famous landmark is the Congregational Mosque or at least the Southeastern part of it uh, in the great city of Herat. And um, uh, it exemplifies uh, both the brick based architecture that was very much um, patronized certainly in the 12th and 13th centuries, and also the fact that it came to be itself uh, repurposed and um, also modified and uh, uh, adapted to new uses. So the upper left image actually shows the um, Timurid intervention in the 15th century. So needless to say, this little structure, the Masjid de Sangi, is, um, has been thought to be really quite a, as forming a contrast to its uh, surrounding architectural landscape. And here are some detailed views um, from the 1950s by the intrepid lady photographer, Josephine Powell, whom I always, uh, thank as frequently as I can, because it is thanks to her uh, documentation in many of the remote parts of Afghanistan that works such as mine can actually progress in the present day. Just to um, give a little bit of uh, the background that on um, the study of this uh, seemingly anomalous little structure, which in the map on the upper left, shows approximately its location. And as you can see, it's uh, uh, west and indeed northwest slightly of the city of Kandahar in Afghanistan. And uh, from the very beginning, um, scholars have sought its models and precedents in the Northwestern Indian building traditions. And uh, this was something that um, was posited from the earliest publications and was effectively argued, I think, uh, indicating that this was really the outcome of the migration of labor forces to these parts of um, these reaches of Central Asia effectively in what is modern Afghanistan in the wake of the so-called Khorid incursions into the North Indian Plains, which 
essentially opened up the circuit of mobility of skilled labor, basically both eastward as well as westward. So in that sense, this structure has been explicated as certainly deriving from these Northwestern Indian traditions. Uh, and it is uh, datable to the very early 13th century, circa 1200, and um, is thus explained as um, really the outcome of these uh, migrations of people who were seeking new patronage and new opportunities in the wake of the uh, Horid establishment in Northern India in the last decade of the 12th century. I, um, what I argued and something that I circulated to my fellow panelists was really a question of the precise precedents or models to which this structure might have referred. Most scholars really have um, resorted to the uh, temple architecture of Northwestern India as providing abundant uh, both precedents as well as contemporary models to the structure. And this is very much um, to be uh, something that is kept in mind, but I instead had argued that there was already a very strong and established tradition of building for Islamic ritual purposes in Northwestern India. And so really, we ought to be drawing more precise parallels with the uh, Islamic structures that were uh, fully developed and frequently patronized in uh, these Northwestern Indian regions. So I think it is important to make more precise um, this type of reference. And indeed, aside from the structures, there are there is also evidence of textual sources, such as the Jayapracha, which originally um, could have been composed by the mid 12th century, but indeed the manuscript that is now available um, is uh, datable to the 17th century. And therein um, is the famous chapter of the Rehmana Prasad, uh, described as a Nirakar Prasad, uh, just a couple of the key words being circled here. Um, so again, both architecturally as well as textually, there is uh, this notion that there was a robust tradition for building within Islamic ritual ambits. And so, in fact, uh, rather than always comparing structures such as uh, the Afghan uh, building to temples, it's actually much more accurate historically to seek precedents and stylistic parallels, as well as iconographic ones in that same region's um, Islamic ritual buildings, which are primarily what survive. Now, um, another question about this little structure is what its actual function was. It's typically um, thought or it is referred to as a masjid because of the presence of a mihrab, generally correctly oriented. However, by this period, um, it uh, was also quite commonplace to have mihrabs within funerary structures. And because of the size, as you see on the plan here of the building or of the little structure, more like it's actually extremely small and really not um, uh, of a scale to uh, afford uh, extensive congregational worship. And um, most likely it was some kind of a funerary structure uh, with of course this mihrab incorporated. So the idea of it's being a masjid, even though that's how it is popularly known, uh, actually it was more than likely a funerary structure or a tomb um, rather than a mosque per se. So what I would like to do is actually extend some of these findings to re-examine some equally long known other stone elements from Afghanistan, specifically these plaques, which have been written up about, as you see, all the way from the 1950s, some having been um, 
located at the small uh, citadel or near the small citadel of Boost, which is um, to the southwest of the city of Grasny. And uh, similar plaques were also found uh, in or around actually the city of Grasny, which examples of which you see on the bottom. Two things to note is that they are referred to differently, the boost examples being thought of as funerary plaques, while the Ghazni examples might better be characterized as patronage plaques because of the inscriptions and what they convey. Um, the boost examples do indicate that they are commemorating a deceased person while um, the uh, bottom set from Ghazni seemed to indicate that uh, there were actually um, records, if you will, of certain types of patronage. And finally, I should point to the example on the lower right, which was until just recently actually on the website of the auction house Bonhams, in um, and was offered for sale in October of last year. So um, clearly these elements are being rediscovered and also uh, perhaps floated on the um, antiquities market. Also alongside these plaques, which have long been known, um, another extensive uh, series of uh, stone elements have been these grave markers or in or sarcophagi, perhaps the most famous of which is the actual tomb of Sultan Mahmud uh, Ghaznavi, which you see on the top, and a uh, second close, um, uh, equal, almost equally famous grave is that of his son Masud I, both in one of the cemeteries around the city of Ghazna. And, um, uh, finally, there are many, many hundreds, if not even thousands of graves that in fact formed the basis for an extremely important study in 2003 by the archaeologist and scholar Roberta Junta. And um, these actually are for our present purposes what I will be focusing on to uh, tease out some of the themes that we are addressing in the panel. Um, these uh, uh, previous uh, fragments as well as entire funerary markers are really quite distinctive and that becomes clear when we do even a cursory comparison with for example, 10th century grave markers or sarcophagi from Iran, for example, um, which uh, formally and in terms of the style of the epigraphy are quite different from the examples that we find in the cemeteries around Ghazni. And another perhaps uh, parallel format that we find also from Iran it are these uh, actual stelae, but again, um, in terms of the epigraphy as well as uh, morphologically, these elements or, or these traditions in Iran of funerary markers uh, actually are, are to be distinguished from what we find around the city of Ghazni. So um, I uh, can't help but to bring to the fore a little quote from uh, my colleague Elizabeth Lamborn's publication of 2004 that highlights the fact that most of these um, funerary markers, both from Ghazni as well as these from Iran, have been studied primarily for the content as well as the style of the script, but the content of the epigraphy. Undoubtedly, that is extremely important, but that is not the only set of data that these objects offer to us. Indeed, there are um, other perspectives and much other extremely rich information to be derived. So what I propose is um, uh, three points that I would like to uh, discuss a little bit in detail in the time that remains. One is that in fact, many, though certainly not all of the gravestones that are to be found in the vicinity of uh, the Ghazni uh, cemeteries 
most likely were made by Northwestern Indian trained carvers who actually were migrating, as mentioned before, in search of new patronage and opportunities uh, as of um, the later 12th century in the wake of this expanded political dispensation that was established by uh, the Hurids as of the mid 1190s. Another point that is important to emphasize upon analyzing these fragments as well as multi-component uh, uh, gravestones is that their styles and iconographies are clearly derived from what we might think of generally as the Madhu Gurja great tradition, but indeed there were uh, 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 slight and subtle and other regional variations among this great tradition. And um, those should be kept in mind as well. But collectively, um, I think that many of the stylistic and iconographic elements of these gravestones uh, actually are very beneficially studied from the perspective of this um, Northwestern Indian set of traditions that was making, um, uh, that was responsible, if you will, for governing the uh, prescribed rules in forming many, many things out of stone. And finally, I think it's important that in light of the evidence of these gravestones from Ghazni, that we actually reconsider our uh, 20th and 21st century contemporary divergence between architecture and sculpture. Indeed, I think um, for one, this is not uh, necessarily how uh, our forebears, if you will, a millennium in the past might have thought of the type of work that they were doing and um, thinking of buildings and objects really much more on a continuum is a more productive way to imagine the actual design practices that were implemented by these skilled workers in the past. So just um, to put forth brief examples of each of these points, I um, would uh, bring to our attention um, here the uh, tomb of one Abu Jafar Muhammad, which is identifiable thanks to the inscription that still survives on, um, what, on its actual capstone and hence demonstrating the immense importance that epigraphy and its study can provide. But complementing this, I think we should look at the object as a whole. And on the right, of course, you see the drawing that demonstrates its multi-component nature, where each of its elements was actually carved separately. And then the uh, miniature structure, if I may be so bold, was actually assembled of these constituent parts. And as a parallel um, uh, from the region to which we are referring in the Northwestern Indian uh, area, uh, we can make reference to the site again of Padreshwar, where there were also these stacked sort of multi-component miniature structures, if you will, that were um, also uh, quite abundant, uh, certainly around some of the principal shrines at this locality of Badreshwar. So this is not an um, out of the blue or an unusual um, creation or set of creations that was taking place in uh, Western Afghanistan. Indeed, um, this was an established practice for marking the graves of important personages in the very heartland of the Maru Gurja traditions by the 12th century as well. Also, when we examine extremely closely these uh, components that come down to us, a couple of points uh, become clear. For one thing, many of their iconographies are recognizable from standing structures in Northwestern India. 
um, for those whose eyes are very much alive to the various uh, series of sequences of moldings that characterize temple elevations. I think each and every one of these friezes will be recognizable. And indeed, the perhaps new element, the new part of a frieze that was um, added to the vocabulary was the inscriptional frieze. Anapurna, I think you're on because perhaps I'm running low on time. Okay. Yes. Um, just uh, two more examples to prove this point, or actually one. Um, finally, I did want to uh, say that um, this continuum between building and object is something that is nicely demonstrated by uh, this uh, close up of the moldings at the 11th century Surya temple, which uh, uh, are extremely recognizable, as said before, from the various components that make up the grave markers. So by way of conclusion, uh, just um, saying that in fact, the um, masjid, so to speak, in south in western afghanistan was not in um arguably anomalous in fact it was part of this um other architectural culture that existed in the region side by side with the uh brick-based what is referred to as a post seljuk tradition by some scholars so hopefully you'll have feedback and input um, after all of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Now I invite uh, Hakim Samir Hamdani to please make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna Purna. Uh, and uh, let me directly go into the presentation, which is primarily about a, a site, uh, the Imam Bada in Kashmir. Now, uh, the Imam Bada that I will be talking about is uh, traditionally in Kashmir known as Marak. The word uh, is derived from the Persian word Maraka, uh, which means literally a, ba a battleground. Uh, we don't know much about the whole history of when uh, Imam Bada as a building typology becomes a part of the uh, Muslim landscape in Kashmir. It, as a site, this uh, specific Imam Bada is also part of a contested history in Kashmir. It marks a sectarian divide between the Shias and the Sunnis of Kashmir as such. Historically, the memory that the Kashmiri Shias have of the past, they would imagine that as a site, this uh, specific Imam Bada dates back to around, let's say, early part of the 16th century when Kashmir was ruled by a Muslim dynasty of Shiite origin. Uh, but then we have no textual or even an archaeological evidence which would prove that it was there at a, such an early period. But if it was, then this would be one of the earliest Imam Bada that we have in India. And now generally to give an idea about how Muslim rule comes in Kashmir, it happens in around early part of the 14th century. It's not a part of the conquest as happens in most of the Northern Plains of South Asia. It's an internal process. We have a Buddhist uh, king who comes from the North Ladakh, conquers Kashmir, and then at a certain part, he converts to Islam, Rinchana, and his Muslim name is Sadruddin. Then we have the Kashmiri Sultanate is broadly classified into two distinct periods of the Shamiris who are a ruling Sunni dynasty and the Chaks who come somewhere towards the end of the uh, mid to end part of the 16th century. But what's important about the Chaks is that they are a Shiite dynasty and many of these symbols of Shiite identity in Kashmir originate or come from that period itself. So again, going back to what the Kashmiri Shiites have written about history in terms of the Tazkaras or even the Tariqs, generally they do assume that the Imam Bada that we are talking about was something that was constructed somewhere around early part of uh, uh, 16th century, maybe around 1550s, maybe 1550s. So after that, we have the Mughal rules and the Afghan rule in Kashmir. Now, 
this gives a basic idea about what is happening in Srinagar. So mostly the whole uh, symbols of Muslimness in Kashmir are generated in the principal city, which is Srinagar. Most of the missionaries and the Malaks and the Sufis are, who are coming to Kashmir from Persian lands, from Khorasan, from Faras, etc., are settling down in Srinagar. And at Srinagar, they are basically setting up their own Khanakas. If you have an overview of the city as it is in the Sultanate period, you would find that there are two areas, one towards the Hasnabad area, which is here, and one other at Zaribal, which are basically Shiite dominated areas in the city. So these are distinct from the rest of the city. So we have a sort of a Shiite enclave to the north and to the east of the city. And the Imam Bada that we are talking about is located at Zadibal. So these are basically procession routes I might be able to talk about later. But basically, uh, in terms of the form, where does the Imam Bada as a form come from? So somewhere around in 1500, uh, 1402, we have the first courtyard mosque in Srinagar, and it's known as the Jamia Srinagar. The mosque is primarily based upon the what we are now called the 41 plan mosque. It's a uh, plan of Iranian origin. In India, in North India, we have the Bekapuri Mosque in, in Delhi, which is the first sort of the 41 mosque that you get in India. And somewhere down almost some years later, down in 1402, we have the same plan imported into Srinagar, and we have the first Jamia Masjid constructed in Srinagar. So if you see, it's a basically a courtyard plan mosque with the four Iwans on the four cardinal direction. The Imam Bara that is constructed later on, and again, we have no idea actually when it was constructed, even if assuming that it has an earlier precedence is constructed somewhere around in, let's say, uh, 15th or early 16th century, it follows the same uh, plan form as of the Jamia Majid. The only difference is in terms of the scale. So for the Jamia Majid, we have a scale which is around 117 meters by 115 meters or something around that. But for the Imam Bara at um, Zadibal, the size is around 22 meters by 22 meters. So these are not two scale drawings. As a, uh, uh, so you can see that the form, the building forms are similar. The only difference that is happening out here is that the central courtyard, which is an open courtyard, in case of the Jamia Majid, which is on the left side, becomes a covered part a covered section. And then again, on the sides, rather than having a single awan, you have these uh, uh, galleries, dalans, which are on a multiple level. But why is this happening? So this is basically a sort of an exonometric, which gives you an idea about the plan form, how it was developed. So the whole idea is that as a square form, uh, more, it is not a plan form that is really sort of something that uh, you are happy with in terms of a mosque, because for mosque you do require a sort of a rectilinear, linear uh, plan form which would accommodate the linear rows of worship. But in an Imam Bada and the way the tradition was in Kashmir, you have these sort of central concentric circle, and all the audiences sort of the, um, surrounding circles, concentric circles. So the square plan form does actually fit in with the purpose of the assembly, the majlis that is happening there. So around here at the center, you have what is known as the pocket. So these will be the central audience, the central performance space. And on these sides, if you can make it out, there are these sort of side dalans, which are almost like an amphitheater, wherein you have these step dalans on the side, mostly used by female worship with the women worshippers who have a clear line of vision towards the central area. This is basically the Jami Majid in Srinagar, so you can get the idea of the plan and also the visuals of the Majid as, as they are. But coming back to the Imam Bharat, now these are the only uh, images that we had of the old structure which dated back uh, somewhere to 1870. So this is the part of the building that was reconstructed in 1870. And again, for a second, going back to the etymology of the uh, word mark, so in Muntakhabul Tariq, Badaini speaks about the fact that after Himayun returned back to Delhi, you have these Muharram Majalises in Delhi. And he refers to these Majalis as Maraka. In Kashmir, there's the same word that you find used for Zadibad Imam Bala, which is the first Imam Bala we have there. And at the point when it was constructed, it's said to have been patronized by the court. So we have the prime minister of the Shamiris who sort of undertakes the construction of the Imam Bala. But then over a period of time, this becomes a point of conflict between the Sunnis and the Shia. So there is a written a recorded history wherein it said around seven or eight times the building was burned down during the 
case of riots between the Shias and the Sunnis. This structure, the one that is in the picture, is no longer there. This dates back to 1870s. And the construction of this site was basically overseen by Shiite traders, merchants who were engaged in the rather lucrative shawl business at that point. So during the 18th, 19th century, we find that most of the economy of the city, most of the economy of Kashmir is primarily centered around the Kashmiri shawls, which has acquired a rather wider fame, not only in India, but again in the 19th century, we find that it travels all the way up to uh, Europe. So the money that is coming for the construction, the patronage is coming from the community itself. And as a part of the 19th century, the sort of the political discourse that's happening in the 19th century. This is also a period when Kashmir is no longer under Muslim rule. So after almost five centuries of continuous Muslim rule, starting from the native Sultanate and going all the way down to the Durani's under Ahmed Shah Abdali and his successors, this is for the first time that the region and the rulership is uh, overseen by a non-native, non-Muslim rulers. First, it becomes a part of the Punjab Darbar of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and then we have the Dograts coming in 1947. So more or less, this is a period wherein uh, the sacred spaces or the sacred uh, Muslim spaces in the city are no longer governed by the Sunni elite. So this is a point wherein the Shia, the Shia men of Apa, the Shia men of wealth, find the opportunity so, to sort of re-establish their presence in the city. So the first thing that they do is in 1830, they construct the mark. And this is the first reference that we have to a building per se. Yes, we have an idea that because this area was burned up at certain periods in history. So there are these notions that even Imam Bada was there and it was burned. But in 1830, we know we have the records, we have the sort of the detailed records in terms of the uh, grants, etc. Uh, of a construction ha happening, the building gets immediately burned down in a riot which takes place only one year after its construction in 1830. Then we find that there are a uh, wide Shia diaspora which is in Awadh because Awadh is again a Shiite rule state. So the prime minister at that time is a Kashmir, of a Kashmiri origin, Hakim Mahdi Khan. So he sends in the money to rebuild the Imam Bara. It's again constructed. Again, there is a riot in 1878, again gets burned up. So in between 1830 and 1870, the whole process of construction and patronage of the shrine and the various assemblies that are taking place, the various performances that are taking place within the Imam Bara are basically overseen by Kashmiri diaspora based in Peshawar, Kashmiri diaspora based in Awadh, and Kashmiri merchants, traders, shawl traders primarily who are functioning from Srinagar city. So overall, you see there is this sort of a concentrated effort by the Shia community at this point to sort of re-establish Marat as a symbol of Shiite identity in a city which is no longer governed by a Sunni sense of what it means to be a Muslim. So coming to the architecture, which is rather the important part of this whole discussion, what is the building all about? So these are some of the archival pictures that survive of the building as it was before it was reconstructed. So internally, the building is again, you have a sort of an idea of a forest like wooden column structure with the side galleries. And on the ceiling, you have these paper mache uh, ceilings motifs. If I go, this is an Imam Bara which is at Hassanabad that was again constructed somewhere in 1870. So the Imam Bara, the which is this one, you can again see it formed the prototype for all the rest of the Imam Bara that were constructed. You have the central uh, double head space, which is used for the main congregation on the sides. You have the galleries out here. You can actually make out the galleries. And because most of the paper mache artisans in the city at that point, and even today were of Shiite faith, you find that the, uh, uh, ceilings which are done in paper mache were basically a part of the that uh, project of piety wherein these ceilings were donated or they were made by craftsmen without taking any charges for the labor involved. So it was also a part wherein the whole community was involved. So for Hasnabad we have a text which speaks about the fact that the labor force and that is around the total labor force is around 1000 labor days were donated by the surrounding community and the only thing that they 
it was a public uh, langar which was organized by the mohalla surrounding mohalla where rest no one charged anything for the construction of the mosque similarly for the reconstruction of the zadibul imamara in the 1830s there are references that in addition to the money that they got from the uh, nawab at awad a woman within srinagar donated their pieces of jewelry etc to the construction process so it is basically a coming together of the community in trying to build up this, these symbols of their community identity and at this point this community identity is basically a very sectarian identity it does manifest the shianness of the community so uh, again uh, this is a sort of a contemporary imamara that was constructed somewhere around 1940s so again it speaks about the language is more or less similar to what was happening and i think i'm running out of time though i'm trying to be as fast as i can uh these are some of the other pictures we have of the imam barat hasnabad which speaks about the volume of the building and the architecture so this is a part which was seen done in a uh, part of the building was seen done in uh, early 1930s so you can see the creeping colonial influences especially in terms of the brickwork and the stonework that is on the ground floor the part of the building that was rebuilt at that point this is again the same uh, example of the imam barat hasnabad so you can see the prom it has a certain resemblance to the jami masjid in terms of the four you know, pishtaq but the pishtaqs are not that deeply developed so these are others this is again an example of the paper mashi ceiling so the motif again is of the base leaves which is sort of quite common it comes from the kashmiri shawls as well and then it's used in almost all traditional kashmiri crafts in the 19th century out here is done in the paper mashi and the these are some of the older ceilings uh, that we had examples of the ceilings but it's gone it's no longer there this is of the imam bara at hasan abad so i'll just sort of just run through it so this shows the sort of the variation that we are getting and this is a imam bara at badgam which is done in right now in a minute or two yeah yeah i'll just sort of end it up there so uh, basically again this is sort of an this gives you an idea about the how the organization of the majlis takes place so you can make out the concentric circles arrange out a certain central space so basically in the end i'd say this is a plan from that is a non native plan from it comes from the iranian plan mosque it's sort of incorporated first in case of the jamia masjid and then and jamia masjid is a sunni masjid in srinagar at that point it is reincorporated in the designing of a shiite structure but because of the fact that the performance is so totally different it's no longer used for prayers it's no longer used for namaz you find that the central space which would have been open to the sky is the main central portion it's so like the focus of the whole surrounding epics here they're happening all around and you can get an idea of that so i'll just leave it at that point thank you and put your own note Thank you so much. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Samir, for your wonderful presentation. I invite Bika Ghosh to now uh, present on uh, the temples in Bengal. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, thank you, Annapurna, for inviting me into this discussion. Um, I've already learned a ton, and to the Bangalore International Center, of which I heard so much from um, your major fans, and all of you. Yeah, on a Friday night to hang out with us, looking at buildings and building types of significantly long ago times. Um, I'm going to jump right in. and give you a brief picture of what's happening on the other side of the subcontinent um in the wake of the mughal conquest of bengal in 1750 sorry 1575 um bengali local landholders hindus and muslims seem to have recognized opportunity in the transition that followed local courts consolidated their positions through various strategies including the patronage of religious communities and institutions at bishnupur the malla rajas sponsored the construction of temples adorned with terracotta panels such as this these architectural experiments contributed to mapping a vaishnav mandala 
a place suitable for remembering Krishna and living in his presence, as had been recommended in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the most important text of the Gaudiya tradition. Through such practices, Vishnupur came to be identified as a Gupta or hidden Vrindavan in Bengal, I have argued previously. Today I want to explore these temples as spaces for stimulating rasa, the emotional and bodily dimensions of the spiritual transformation that we see visualized on temple walls. Specifically, I'll focus on the Shamrai temple today, the earliest and the most lavishly adorned of them. Um, and this structure dates to, excuse me, yeah, this structure dates to 1643. Um, and it's only for the sake of time, you know, that I'm not bringing other examples because we do have many others in different materials as well, like we've seen in the other case studies. Um, the use of the Rash Mandal or Ras Mandala is deliberate and strategic at this site. It is an experiment that draws attention to the region's new architectural formulations. The introduction of a large courtyard for collective devotion, an upper pavilion that creates a double story structure now. This circular dance is inscribed in two large roundels flanking the main entrance on the south, which you see on the right hand side of this slide. And this directional reorientation, I want to remind you, marks a significant break from the main east-facing curvilinear towered temple style that is associated with North India, the Nagara style, which I'm showing you in an example on the left. Instead, set symmetrically on either side of the triple arches, the Ras Mandala links a curvature, a curved cornice that is quite distinctive to Bengal. These Ras circles distinguish Bengali architecture appropriated from the sagging thatch of local huts, which you see on the left, and indeed had been monumentalized already in permanent materials, both brick and stone, in the shrines and mosques of the Sultanate branding them as Bengali, even before we get to these temples, right? You see that curve on the Jami Masjid at Atiya in Tangail district, now in Bangladesh, and you see it in con this contemporaneous temple, quite pronounced, and it is this curve, of course, that Shah Jahan appropriates um, for Delhi and Agra. At the center of this circle, you see Krishna flanked by Radha and a second attendant on the left and two concentric rows of dancers with Krishna reduplicating himself to fulfill the fantasies of each of his gopis as the Bhagavad Puran tells us. You see drummers and musicians in the corners and peacocks and deer that gather marking the site as Vindavan, the woods. Now the temple has a third medallion inside the sanctum at the very back. So these exceptionally large panels distinct from all of the other panels on the structure and their prominent location indicates the significance of the form for this devotional community that is cohering in the 17th century. Setting Krishna's dance in motion, they also mobilized the stationary body of an icon, I would imagine, when this temple was in use, and now it is not. Um, so I'm showing you the icon of Shamrai, which is worshipped collectively in the Vishnupur Raj home shrine, along with many others, you know, that they can no longer maintain individually. However, living deities in the town's other temples allow us to imagine how the Shamrai altar may have also displayed the divine couple. And yet other figures now in museum collections reveal that slow, swaying motion that distinguishes these dancing bodies at the center of the circle. Together this imagery repeated in terracotta and in the sanctum figures thus recreates that hallowed circle of dancers and the momentum of the divine dance 
or worshippers who gather at these temples. They visualize the devotional goal of aesthetic experience to move, literally move the devotee into sharing in the heady emotional upsurge of ecstatic dance with Krishna, Samkirtan in the Bengali tradition. And here you see the temple surfaces lined with dancing figures holding hands. Yeah. So on the one hand, we've got the image behind the sanctum, the two on the front marked in red on this ground plan, as well as all of the others, you know, sheathing the ceiling, dance rows of dancers and around these pillars, right? In, in rows repeatedly, suggesting, I argue, that they create the dance physically on the temple walls, imprinting it in a way that it extends into the devotional community in the courtyard. I suggest that it transforms the temple itself into the Ras Mandala. And in so doing, the temple grounds consecrate a new Vaishnava realm, described as a transformation of a wilderness in the Gaudiya literature. And here are details to show you how you know, those individual panels contextualize to cover the entire surface, right? Foregrounded on this earliest Krishna temple, the Ras Mandala also commemorates the foundation of the kingdom of Vishnupur, the first critical stronghold in the process of consolidating a Vaishnava realm in Bengal. As the narrative is told today in Vishnupur, Srinibash Acharya, disciple of the Brindaban Goswamis, traveled with a cartload of books from North India. When he stopped in Bishnupur, the guru ultimately converted the local king. He did so partly by introducing the king to the potency of the Rash Mandala. And you see him here, marked in blue, at the top of the set of the traditional 10 incarnations, suggesting that he, like Chaitanya, was incorporated into that sacred lineage. Srinivas's cartload of books had been stolen while he was resting. And in tracking them down, he arrives at the local court. Here he recites the last Rasdila verses from the Bhagavata Puran and offers his personal explication. His oration was so moving that we're told the king was moved to tears. He fell at his feet and recognized Srinivas as his teacher and dedicated his life and realm to championing the worship practices introduced. And as symbol of the king and his realm's spiritual transformation and the political fortunes of this dynasty, the circular forms of Krishna's dance are thus lavished on his earliest patronized temple. This prominent placement then asserts that the realm is dedicated to Krishna. They set in motion the Leela and the performance of Kirtan, the singing and dancing in the living community. And mirroring Kirtan, these mandala would have accentuated the process for, dis for reducing distance between a depicted mythical past and a historical present. Ecstatic dancing in the Gaudiya tradition often revealed intoxicating visions. The participant or even entire groups felt that sacred presence palpably through exhilarating intimate bodily experiences involving shaking, frothing at the mouth, hallucinating. And visions and movement can thus become interconnected in the cultivation of the emotional state of rasa, bhakti rasa in this case. Lyrics of Bengali songs equally underscore that intimate bodily process, the experience of rasa. When sung in these courtyards, they would surely have moved the terracotta form of Krishna and his swaying body in rhythm with that of the beholder. And I quote one example, which you can read along. Sham, who delights in the sport of ras, dances in charming steps and with delightful movements of the body. Lutes and other musical instruments are being played. Drums are raising a beautiful note. Tata thai thai thai. Kanu raises a charming music with his lovely anklets. And Radha is singing a fine melody in proper beats. 
and in harmony. Shivaram has lost his consciousness in joy and is looking at the embodiment of Ras. Of Ras, sorry. Ras overflows beyond that dancing body. That signature line, Bhonita, of this song suggests that the poet, as he recreates the dance in his composition, feels that melody, the movement and the beat with such force that it overcomes him. Singers and dancers would have known that he could only have had such privileged access to the play of the gods in the form of a gopi. As he submits to the emotion and awareness of his physical surroundings and his body slips away, the poet moves slowly, swiftly, skillfully, seamlessly. It is difficult to distinguish one point of view from the other in the poetry. It is only in the final line that he testifies to his own presence in the Leela and discloses his own identity now as a gopi, transformed. His response then offers a model for Kirtan singers to participate in the Leela that is evoked in his poetic construction. These kinds of songs performed in rousing Kirtan sessions in temple courtyards must surely have resonated with the swaying terracotta form of Krishna in the mandala on the walls of the temple. And not surprisingly, this form of Krishna capable of arousing such intense response is honored in Gaudiya temples as the primary focus of devotional attention. In Bishnupur's living temples today, we see sets of eight painted wooden figures of these gopis, the special eight. They are usually brought out from storage, dressed up on either side of the divine couple for celebrations. Extending from that central couple, they evoke this continuous circle of the terracotta dance. And the arc of that arrangement here suggests an open circle that sweeps worshipers into the circle themselves. The composition thus expresses the intensely bodily, sensorial, and emotional experience of negotiating sacred presence and absence, hiddenness and revelation, and miraculous reduplication at the very core of the Ras Lila. And I want to bring you back then to the ground plan um, to bring it in back to the conversation about architecture proper. A temple in mid 17th century Bengal then not only provides space for rituals, but a site for imaginative stimulation of Krishna's play. The temple with its sculpted surfaces brings the ordinary, if, sorry, brings the originary celestial dance to the courtyard for a new generation of young devotees to be moved to be inspired as had been Chaitanya and Srinivas after him, generation after generation. Such spaces blur the distinctions between inside and outside, sculpture and architecture. It also calls, calls for a reassessment of iconicity. That is to say, the sacredness of the divine in such practice must have been shared across the murti in the sanctum the terracotta imagery on the walls and the bodies of living dancers and singers in a tumultuous overflow of rasa. And I believe the ground plan actually suggests that kind of concentricity if you want to layer it some. Um, the temple thus is an icon, I would argue, a symbol of the Vaishnava realm as it expanded from this epicenter at Bishnupur in the 17th century reverberating through the region. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the participants. I request everybody, uh, um, Alka and Hakim, to please come back online and uh, so we can begin our conversation. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much. So I think, let me just begin by uh, posing a question to uh, the last speaker and then I'll move backwards. Um, you showed us this wonderful temple which developed out of um, a kind of a, well, visually, there seemed to be like a desired silhouette, that wonderful curve of the thatched hut. So if you could speak a little bit about that, I would really appreciate that. And then I also would like to uh, ask you 
about the congregational aspect of Kirtan and the way that the, the temple accommodates uh, this sort of gathering of people in worship. And we know that, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, but was there such an engagement with congregational worship prior to the Ratna temple form that you're speaking about so beautifully? And if this, there wasn't, um, maybe there was, as you spoke about in your essays that I've read in your book, that there was a, the, the huts have a congregational space for within the family, but uh, a gathering space within the family, but a gathering place isn't the same as a congregational space. There's a, diff there's a shift in, uh, in both purpose and in semiotic value. So I was wondering where you would think, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, thank you. Sure. Great questions. Um, the hut is, you know, sort of foundational for vernacular, right? It's a very successful form in this weather with you know, land and water distinctions blurring periodically. Um, bamboo offers a pliability. And these, the curve, the sag of the hut, of course, comes from the edges drooping down over time, right? With the piling of thatch and water just rolls down in the downpour of Bengal monsoons. Um, when it's simulated in stone and then brick, um, it's an artifice. Right, it's intentional. It is very difficult to reproduce, right? And if yes. you think about these terracotta surfaces, every single one of those panels has to be modified to take that curve, right? Um, all the way to the bottom. So this is no mean feat. These are not, you know, some people will say, oh, they're repeated panels, but they are made individually to accommodate that curvature. And, and the, the same with the upper surface. Hmm? And the curvature of each building that's being made. It's not just the generic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Same with the roof, right? The ceiling and the roof adjustments are made to sit that curve as it rises, the slope, right? And we see these across mosques and huts. Some actually perfectly simulate the appearance of the hut on the surface, not this particular temple. Um, so you can start to see the deep significance of the, the Bangla of Shah Jahan and the bungalow of the British, um, right? Um, as, it, as the form keeps adapting and becoming more contemporaneous as do all <laughs> vernaculars. Um, so that's the first part that begins to address, yeah, your question. I mean, I could lay this out in images, but we don't have that kind of time. Um, the congregational piece is, is a question mark. You know, we do have, right? You look at the Adina Masjid, um, the largest mosque built in South Asia, we know, right? So there is congregational activity um, and Adina is not the only one. There are many big mosques in Bengal, in Gaur, still surviving as well as you know, other realms, even in Birbhum for the West. Um, and we have these clustered huts that create homesteads, right? Little gatherings uh, of these, you know, and to this day, you, Richard Eaton is right when he says, when there is that much water, these huts need to cluster in a different kind of way, right? as the terrain shifts in the flooding um, delta, right? And the distinction between you know, land and water becomes so malleable, right? So that sense of a huddle where you get on a boat to go to this little mosque, little covered mosque to pray, for example, in Bangladesh today, creates a different sense of huddle, I, I would imagine. Um, and nothing that I've seen of the early temples, you know, and most of these are in sort of the Purulia Jhakand end, um, where there is some semblance of a continuity of structure still preserved, would suggest that we're seeing um, large, at least architectural space. Yeah, um, nothing covered, no hypostyle halls whatsoever. 
no halls period um any halls are on structures that have been added on much later in cement um so we're seeing something different right and people have done some work on the musical form to lots of just just that bhakti singing draws on a long standing tradition in various other mystical you know communities and traditions um so all of that is what leads me to think that we're looking at something that is distinctly marking these very elaborate boxed in courtyards in brick right so, um, some quite grand looking things as well right with their particular relationship with the local pond for ritual purposes and things like that as it they get laid out across the town i don't want to hog all the time so i'm going to leave more of our conversation for later i'd like to come to uh, samir um i really wanted to ask ask you a very simple question and I hope you'll take it in whichever way you want you would like. So you were talking about papier mache and the way that uh, Shia artisans who were papier mache artists within Srinagar were uh, were involved in making those gorgeous ceilings in the Imambara. But it's also very curious what about the were there any Sunni builders of these specifically Shia uh, buildings? Um, how would non-Muslim builders and get involved in such structure making? I mean, uh, the thing is that generally, uh, if these Imam Bardas were actually constructed, let's say in the 15th century, we don't know, it would have been a totally different story. But what we are uh, studying today is what's been constructed in the 19th century. Okay. And unfortunately in 19th century, Kashmir is segregated on a very communal and sectarian lines. So the divisions are very much out clear. They're in the form. And they're clear in the text. If you read about how people are speaking about, if you're talking about Shias and Sunnis, about their Muslimness and what it means to be Muslim, it's clear in terms of the, how the city is located, in terms of the areas which are basically dominated by the Shias and the Sunnis. So in a question, it is sort of the re-emergence of the Shiite space on a Sunni landscape to be very honest. So this is a phenomenon which is internal to the Sunni Shia community. And if you see it in the background of the fact that there are riots happening, whenever this Imam Bada has been sort of, whenever the construction comes up. So it is a very antagonistic relation between the Shias and the Sunnis at that period. But as we proceed towards the earlier part of the 20th century, and that's a period wherein Kashmir, uh, uh, the whole nature of the dialogue, the political dialogue in the community changes because now it's a Muslimness against the Hindu rulers. We find that this very Imam Bada becomes a place wherein the Shias and the Sunnis are coming together in their demand against another other, which is the ruler who is not a Muslim. So there are these sort of subtle uh, uh, ways in which the communities are articulating their presence and the way they are sort of there's a discourse that's happening in between them, in spite of the fact that it starts at a very negative point, as a sort of very antagonistic point wherein they started. But over a period of time, as you march towards the later part of the 19th century, you find that there is engagement. And you see, it starts with the Sunni traders. So there are the Shia traders and there are the Sunni Shia traders, and they form the elite of the community, and it's an urban community. Uh, and wherein there's a dialogue taking between the elite of the city, and they're trying to sort of manipulate uh, the relation between the two communities is also important because in the later part of the 19th century, we have the Muharram procession happening. So the Shia areas are rather limited, but the procession is happening through the Sunni space. So how do they manage any sort of uh, untoward into event happening on their procession route? So this is wherein the elders of the community come together. Primarily it is traders and merchants. And this is a rather important thing because if you're a merchant, you might have a Sunni employee or a Shiite employee in your Karkhada. So you want to manage the way the city is functioning in a manner which is more peaceful. So the coming together comes at that level, but in terms of the actual construction, uh, it is basically where it, you have records of these many, this Mohalla dedicated this amount of labor in terms of 100, 200 labors, and they came from these Mohalla. So, it's all an internal affair to the community as it is. But then again, in terms of the plan form, you do see that uh, 
it is wherein the Shias are competing or building upon what the Sunnis have built in the Jamia Masjid. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question uh, to Alka Patel and open it up to the audience. So, uh, and this is actually a question. I, I have one last question, which I throw it up to all three of you, but let me first give it to uh, Alka. Could you speak a little bit about the idea of the Rahman Prasada and the Nirakar, which you mentioned in the Jayapricha text that you showed us the image? I think it's very important. Why was it, do you think, necessary? Do you have any thoughts about why it might have been necessary to articulate, to theorize how to make a Rahman Prasada? Um, which is, of course, a masjid or some musallah. It could be a masallah, I suppose, of a, of, a, of a kind. What you will you will teach us, or you will tell us what a Rahman Prasada could be. A second question that I have is, and a point that you made very nicely was, um, and this is this this leads to the rest the other two presentations as well. But you mentioned that architecture and sculpture are not distinctly different activities, but should be seen on a continuum, which I think is very very important because it doesn't create a hierarchy the way we have a hierarchy today in the discipline of architectural history of separating sculpture from architecture. So in Samir's building that he's talking about, there's, um, you can't really think about the space without thinking about this incredible carpet of papier mache across its ceilings. So there's a, there's a deep link between all the parts that come to, together to make this Imam Bada. So in that sense, how do we want to think about the parts of these buildings and making a whole? So what role does mortar or the absence of mortar allow for certain kinds of transformations and movements of building ideas? So if you have a post and lintel system, or if you have a building system where you could dismantle it and re-put it together, or that you build it in modules and transport it, or you produce it in molds and then attach it to a particular context. So it's the part and the whole. The, how do you take all these parts, these modules, and to make a whole? So I leave this question. I, I request Alka to start answering the question, and then I request either Pika or Samir to pick it up. OK, so. Um... Uh, with regard to the uh, Rahmana Prasad as a as a concept, um, I think maybe the most productive way to conceive of it is actually to see it as a development within the way that spaces were made in uh, this particular part of the world at that time. So that um, you know, there had been by, if we accept the date of the mid 12th century, possibly for the composition of that treatise, then by that period, um, one of the examples that I showed actually of this um, newly uh, or recently again written about structure, the Vishnu Ganesh at Dahod in uh, Gujarat. That was one of the uh, temple examples that I showed. And I believe there's an inscription associated with it that um, kind of marks the date of uh, 12, the 1230s in the common era. But um, by this period from the extant examples, it would appear that at least in sacral architecture, there was again, a profound three dimensionality that included iconic forms. They were part of the body of these buildings, but this was precisely one of the things that actually did not work, that, that was not in fact an integral part of this particular ritual practice. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons that it had to be specified. And in that sense, indeed, it was a development very much within this particular context. So that's one thing. And um, the second, um, uh, just kind of touching upon these, again, not to monopolize the time, but the second point that you raise of parts and holes, I think, is very important, um, certainly for 
the work that I presented and which I would like to pursue in that uh, historiographically, again, many of these uh, funerary elements have been mined and remined uh, for the scripted information that they can provide. And certainly the style of the calligraphy, the epigraphic kind of reality is important as we saw, it does impart a lot of information. But I think what gets forgotten because of this, uh, just kind of this historiographical momentum to put a lot of emphasis on the, the uh, textual information is that a lot of the other parts of this whole actually uh, just uh, by default become um, uh, sort of uh, perhaps secondary, they become secondary in the overall consideration. And yet, hopefully, it became clear today how much information they can actually impart um, in tandem with the textual or the epigraphic. So, um, uh, uh, and I mean, one could say a lot more about the traditional distinctions, not only between architecture and sculpture, but between the intellectual specialties of Islamic and other specializations. I think that has played a big part in the ability to um, make visual connections and do the formal analyses that actually could lead to some really interesting new ways, uh, a new um, um, you know, uh, directions of thinking. So, uh, this is kind of an all over the place, perhaps, answer, but hopefully uh, generative of further conversation. Uh, could, could, could I ask you, Samir, to say something to the question about construction systems and parts and holes? Yeah, I mean, so. As well as case, knowledge systems and parts and holes. Yeah. So, in case you generally had a look at the image, you would see that this is basically a preponderance of both in the structures that you have in Kashmir, especially as you come to uh, buildings that are constructed for Muslims, by the Muslims as a place of worship. So, uh, in the earlier period for the temples, in the medieval period, we had stone, but then once we come to the Muslim period, uh, primarily with wood, one, it's the ease of the material. Kashmir is a Himalayan region, so wood is easily available. Secondly, it's easily transportable. Say, uh, thirdly, it's the importance of the fact that uh, wooden hypostyle style of construction takes so much less time. And in Kashmir, with the winter, you have a certain setting time for the mortar. So you can't do a uh, line work in the winter months because you have a freezing point. So what is happening, basically, you have picked up your material of construction, which is wood, then wood has a certain limitation in terms of the module. So the module that you're going to get is around 15 feet by 15 feet or 20 feet by 20 feet. So that's what happens in Jamia Majid. That happens in the Imam Bara. So you have a basic module of around 15 feet by 15 feet, and then it gets repeated how many times, depending upon the overall size. So in case of the Imam Bara at the Zadibal, so it's a, the central square is around 15 meters. So you have five modules of that grid on the either side. Uh, it is a limitation in the sense because of such smaller modules, uh, there is a visual clutter. So you have so many wooden columns happening in case you had a dome structure, or arcade construction, maybe the possibility would have, would have the larger open line of pigeon across the space. Secondly, what's also happening is that these are performance spaces mostly for the oral performance, the sound that you're going to make up. So the amount of fenestrations that you have on the facade are so so limited it is primarily just a small opening on the outer facade to get a certain amount of light and ventilation in this you want the sole volume of sound to resonate within the structure so that's also how they're taking care of the fact that you have a central double height structure and on the side you have two stories and the side stories are used by women so these are again enclosed space so primarily it is a certain simple module of 15 feet or 20 feet, which then gets repeated module after module. And historically, you will again see that wood is perishable. It's sort of, it rots. There are so many issues with it. So there are parts which are older and they're easily sort of replaced. So you don't have to replace the entire structure. You might at a certain point have to just remove a beam or a column and the rest is there. I mean, I remember we were doing a, uh, sorry, sort of the continuum like this. 
we were doing a reconstruction of an 18th century shrine which got burned down in 2011, 2011 and we were actually able to reuse some of the wooden columns. <laughs> That's that, exactly. is, that, is, that is the possibility with wood, which you don't have to a certain extent with brick or mortar. I mean, wood is far, it has its inherent disadvantage, but then the possibilities are so strong and rich that you can actually work with it to a degree that's not possible with other materials. So I'll leave it at that. Pika, would you please uh, contribute to the conversation? Um, the parts and holes taken more broadly. The, part um, of the construction system and mm -hmm. also this idea of building and sculpture, architecture mm -hmm. and sculpture, all of it, construction methodology. I think I was arguing certainly that, uh, you know, sculpture is, is a sheath upon um, the core, right? Completely inseparable from, and you can think of it as embroidery and textile terms and shawls and or however you want to um, to think of the potency lies in that terracotta imagery, you know, to give form to that religious imagination, right? So it's integral and inseparable from both the metal icons, if we think of those as sculpted forms, the murtis for puja, um, the terracotta surfaces and that sculpture, um, if you want to think of it as sculpture and the, the core, which is brick, in this case, upon a stone foundation, very often in these temples, um, local laterite. So that, um, and I think we're also talking about this inseparability of inside to outside. From also from, to pull an old term from Joanne Waghorn, you know, gods of stone, gods of flesh, gods of metal, gods of, uh, you know, of transforming bodies. Um, so that whole continuum also opens up, you know, in, if you think about the ritual dimension of Kirtan. Um, so it's not just limited to construction, I think, you know, iconicity is a key concern um, as part of this larger problem of how to think of what is a temple in this region at this time. So earlier in, you showed us an example from the seventh century of a stone temple from uh, uh, another part of Bengal. And you see this profusion of brick construction. It's not like stone architecture wasn't around. Could you offer us some ideas about why brick was such a favored material? I, to the point, for example, that even when they're thinking about the patched roof, they figure out ways of imagining it in brick. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that. Besides the obvious answer of clay being ubiquitous in this landscape. I suspect it's expense to some extent of shipping and transporting chunks of stone. You know, the person who really started to do this work is Rick Asher um, in starting to identify stone quarries in this belt um, and the ranges of gray. But I think we're also talking about a longstanding tradition of working the two in relation to each other. If you look at the earlier Buddhist material, right? Bahapur, Mahasthan, um, even Nalanda, Vikram Shila, brick and stone uh, integrated. You know, I don't know that they saw these materials as separate in the way that me, coming from outside the tradition, looking at it, is seeing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, where does the delineation in one material end and the other begin? I imagine, and I'm not an architect, you know, or mason. It lies in, I mean, there are concrete constructional choices, like some of what Samir was talking about, that we're seeing alongside the aesthetic, you know, and saving this really expensive stone hunk, the monolith for a stele of the Pala period, for example, the things that we've isolated from their architectural settings, right? And you see them in every museum now, but they come from large brick structures, huge brick cruciform constructions um, very often in monasteries. So there's that kind of thing going on with material as well. Um, and Bengal is a huge region, right? So exactly where these stone quarries are being excavated from, how much 
you know, you have reach clout to have it shipped to your particular location of choice is things we haven't even begun to uncover, you know. Uh, Alka, I wanted to come back to, in a way, leading from uh, Pika's question to your material that you're looking at, you showed us these gravestones and these plaques that were so easily um, uh, either disassembled or assembled from parts or uh, created, in a sense, miniature architecture uh, that could be provide some sort of fuel for an imagined in a building or um, models or even um, or, or even uh, desirable uh, aesthetics for carving and all sorts of things. When you look at the, the Masjid in Lavan that you should began with, uh, would you speak a little bit about how it was constructed out of that understanding that there's these parts that would it, was it possible to say that it was made with the knowledge uh, that parts uh, of this building came from elsewhere, whether literally or imaginatively? Ah, uh, well, I think uh, in, on the literal front, there was initially a debate among, um, you know, the earliest uh, surveyors of the region. And I'm talking about in the 1940s when there were actually um, some Afghan uh, intellectuals, archaeologists who were doing tours to map essentially important sites. Um, there was uh, something of a slight disagreement in terms of whether these were already uh, uh, carved elements that were then put together here. And in some of the images, um, for those who might have had a chance to look very closely. In fact, there's an asymmetry in the facade because two of the columns on one side have a different progression of the shafts than the other side. So um, that, along with other elements, just the sheer anomaly of the building material, which is stone as opposed to the brick, again, you know, that was the industrial infrastructure, if you will, that was already established and the labor and the skill set. So um, I think uh, eventually, I mean, I'm kind of coming down on the side of it's having been um, uh, newly uh, fashioned, if you will, all of its components. I don't think that there was a, a recycling of pre-existing materials. Um, because of various considerations and the argument is uh, long. But I think um, during this period uh, specifically, and it's perhaps unusual to have such an intimate window of time open because we're essentially talking about one or two decades, which is uncommon really of a perspective in virtually any pre-modern, if you will, you know, span of time. But I think that the Shanzabani or the Horid campaigns um, in the 1190s really uh, did something that hadn't been done before, which is actually establishing a political presence of uh, people who were from the Northwest, from the Indian perspective. And um, this is kind of typical of new political structures in that they open up various economies and circulations. So I think that is what we're looking at in terms of its perception as a series of forms or a form that comes from elsewhere. I think that that is extremely varied. In fact, um, the plaques that were shown briefly and also the actual sarcophagus, the tomb of the Sultan, you know, the idol breaker by, par excellence, um, Mahmoud itself had a lot of elements that in fact formally are traceable to Indic forms. So maybe the novelty of these forms would depend on where exactly they are deployed. I think in a place like Khazni, there was already a long 
a history of the utilization of these forms, whether they were actually carved by people trained in Northwestern India or not. There was already a lineage visually and a history, but it's possible that in a place like Farah province in modern parlance or this region in um, southern Hur, uh, historically, it might have been more unusual. So there are also these um, um, provincial versus central kind of considerations, the cosmopolitan versus the vernacular and what constitutes each that are that come into play. So it's hard to say overall whether it was this or that just covering mm -hmm. the entire region. So it's 8.30 now and we've all spent um, one and a half hours talking to each other and presenting our work to this audience that BIC has given us. Um, we haven't gotten any questions from the audience and I'm wondering why. And I think that might be because it's really challenging and, and that's why I wanted to open up this conversation. It's challenging to think about how people build when they are integrating, which is more often the case than building inside of a bubble, when they're integrating a range of different elements, different communities, different religious practices in the making of sacred spaces. So if that's the case, then the, the work of the architectural historian is large. The, that we have to actually make a big gambit to hold lots and lots of material together in a very careful and light way as we move back and forth to understand the, 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 the immensity of human imagination when it comes to making buildings. Would that be a fair way to summarize that? Yes, Pika? Yeah, I feel it that way because I've, when I think about the kind of buildings I've been working on, which are in the Deccan, I'm thinking about why did this, a certain kind of built form emerge so, so suddenly in such a vast way um, in the 13th and 14th century? What made that possible? How did it talk to built forms that existed earlier before the 12th and century and the 13th century before the, that time? How did people who were making temples look at um, buildings that were not temples? How did people who are building temples and mandapas think about how the mandapa was not just a religious building, but just a structure for people to use? How did they think about mandapas when they became used and became masjids, whether they were built whole scale new structures or we're recycling parts, whatever it was. So these are questions that I've been probing and I'm very grateful that we could all watch have this conversation together. And in terms of what I especially received from uh, Samir's talk is that it's really important to think about proportions of buildings and the kinds of sizes materials permit, the, the, the limitations that materials themselves impose on builders what can, what is possible how much can we carry how much can we, how much wood can we possibly grow and um how many trees and um and of course the whole thing about what else is there in the neighborhood always counts so uh thank you so much and thank you raghu for and the entire bic team